my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us start this khutbah with a question. Why would Allah subhanahu jalla fi ula make us go through the pain of hunger and thirst? Understanding that this question usually is posed in the West. Dealing with it, understanding their language, and addressing them in the way they can relate to it. In order for us to understand this and that question in itself and give them the answer that it would make logic and sense to them, you have to take him through a quick journey. First, you ask him a rhetorical question. And say, how would you feel if I told you about a little girl that has no food and water? And then you ask him another question. Now that you cannot go to sleep at night for some reason or another, you go downstairs, turn on the TV, you actually see this young girl that has no food and water, no shelter. The hair is untidy and dusty. The flies on the eyes. She's got a belly that is full of gas. She bends over, grabs a morsel of food, dusts it off, doesn't know what it is, and eats it. How would you feel? See, the first time you only heard about it, so there's one mean of communication, one sense that was used in your body, a hearing sense. So you may be somewhat moved. But the second time we added a visual, you actually didn't just hear about it, you also saw it. So you were moved even more, maybe a tear comes down the eye, a tremble in the cheek, movement of the lips. But if you don't eat and drink yourself, all your body senses are involved. And no one would ever be able to tell you what it feels like to be hungry and thirsty unless you go through it yourself. Now you know what it feels like to be hungry and thirsty, you don't take things for granted. You don't waste the food. You become grateful and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula. You share with the less fortunate than you. You recognize there's a wisdom behind everything. That Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula teaches us how to become the best of human beings through the acts of worship. Teaches us moral conduct through the acts of worship, the ibadah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala links the ibadah with the akhlaq in the Quran in so many places. In Ramadan specifically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us taqwa. The verse that everybody knows. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. Oh, you believe fasting was prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon nation before you. So you may learn taqwa. So the act of worship is that Ramadan, the fasting. And the akhlaq, the moral conduct, the fruit of that is taqwa. As you see in other acts of worship, Indeed, salah wards off evil. So the act of worship is salah. The fruit of it is wards off evil and transgress an act. Zakah, amwalihim sadaqah. Take from the wealth, charity, purify them. 
and multiplies it for them, purifies them from the illness of the heart. To teach us to be jawad, given, generous, not a miserly, stingy. Same with Hajj. In this month, that is two million from inside and two million from outside. No quarrel, no fighting. لا رفث فسوق جدال Nothing. Not even beginning of intimate relations. So you'll see the connection between the acts of worship with the akhlaq, the ibadah. Acts of worship, the fruit of it is that moral conduct and the behavior. So you become the best human being that walks on the face of the earth. It's hands-on management. Islam is a practical religion. It teaches you how to be the best through the acts of worship as you're not doing exercises. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about taqwa, piety. But this khutbah is not specifically about taqwa. It's about the month of Ramadan and the school of Ramadan. So how do you learn taqwa from fasting? The scholars say, if you don't eat and drink in front of people, or not having any beginning of intimate relations between spouses, in front of people, and then you go home and close all the doors, and the only door you open is the door of the fridge. Do you have taqwa, akhi and ukhti? La wallahi. So you learn to have taqwa. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula when you're all alone. And that's when the scholars say, that's the only time you will know whether you have taqwa or not. When you're all alone, when you close all the gates, nobody else sees you. Nobody else hears you except Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula. And you say, Inni akhafullah. When you're all alone, that's when you know whether you have taqwa or not. That's why the scholars will tell you that's the reason it's the secret between you and Allah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the divine tradition. That says that all the acts of the children of Adam and the deeds is for them, except fasting is for I, it's for me. And I will reward him for it. Because it's a secret between you and Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ula. So since he closed all the gates, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open one gate for you. On judgment day, the gate of Rayyan, nobody else will be able to go through this gate except those who fasted for the sake of Allah. So you left your food for the sake of Allah, Allah will feed you from the food of heaven inshaAllah. You left your drink for the sake of Allah, so Allah will quench your thirst from Hawd al Kawthar, inshaAllah. You left your whims and desires, you learn something about yourself for the sake of Allah. Allah will reward you abundance of eternal life and bless in Jannah. Ameen. Now, since you already know you're leaving things that are halal, food and water and intimate relations between spouses are halal. So the scholars will also tell you, how could you be leaving something that is halal and doing something that is haram? Subhanallah. Is it possible, Akhi? Is it possible, Ukhti, that you leave things that are actually halal, eating and drinking, halal food, and halal drinks and intimate relations between spouses are halal. So you're leaving that. And could you be doing something that's haram, even though you're leaving something that's halal? La wallahi. So you learn something about yourself. You're made of body and soul. Some of the scholars say body, soul, and mind, aql. So what you're made of body is a lower being. It's dust, clay. That's your whims and desires. Your spirit is a higher being. Your mind is what differentiates of the decisions you make and the actions you take. 
So if your whims and desires control you, you're a lower being. You're a servant to your own whims and desires. You're imprisoned to your own whims and desires. Slave, poor person can't control your own whims and desires. But if your spiritual side controls your whims and desires, you're on a higher link, higher stature, higher in the sight of Allah. So that's how Islam teaches you to be the best of the best. When you leave things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa jalla fi ulah, Allah rewards you something better. So you learn. There are three aspects and benefits of Ramadan. Spiritual, physical, and social. The social aspect is when we invite one another. Come and eat with me, Akhi. Come to my home. Let's get to know one another. As a community, we fast together. We break our fast together. There is a bond. You give sadaqah. You give the charity after. You help the poor. You know who is whom. Hug and embrace this beautiful bond between the Muslim brothers and sisters. This ummah is one. So you see the unity of the ummah at the time. At least in the community, that's a social bond. And there's a physical aspect to it and benefit to it. That small bag that you have inside of you. You have appetizers, salads, soups and salads and hot and cold main course desserts. Everything goes in a little bag. And it's a reflection. In themselves, have you not seen? Have you pondered to reflect about that small bag that it takes factories to isolate everything that goes into it and it gives you what's pure? Get rid of the impure, subhanallah. So you give that a break. And you're supposed to lose weight in Ramadan. I understand we're supposed to lose weight in Ramadan. But wallahi, I don't understand how we gain weight in Ramadan. Subhanallah. There is a German doctor that puts this hadith in the front door, even though he's not a Muslim yet. But he actually mentioned this hadith when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that. It's behasb ibn Adam, luqimat yuqimna sulba. It is sufficient for the child of Adam, morsels of food. So he can be standing erect, he can be surviving. And if it's not, if you must, it is one third and one third and one third. If we go back, you'll find out the beauty of the physical aspect where we get rid of all the poisonous left over from the year before. Revive your system. And the spiritual side of Ramadan goes back to hadith where the full Khalifa radiallahu anhum an sahabati ajma'een plus Abu Dharr al-Ghafari radiallahu an. When Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asking them, Fima tatahadathun, what were you talking about? They said, We were talking about three things. Before I go through this, ask yourself if you were asked, What were the three things that you favor most or wish for? Or what would you do if somebody's asking you, What were the three wishes? Ask yourself and be honest with yourself when you answer. And keep that in the back of your mind and listen to the best of those who walk the face of the earth after prophets and messengers. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an said, I love three things. I love sitting and seeing you between your hands and looking at you and spending my money for the sake of Allah upon you. 
وأنت يا عمر رضي الله عنه أحب الحق وقول الحق وزهق الباطل الفاروق saying the truth and joining good and forbidding evil وأنت يا عثمان رضي الله عنه he says إفشاء السلام وإطعام الطعام والصلاة بالليل والناس نيام he says spreading peace and greeting sharing the food and staying up at night to pray while people to sleep so how are you doing أخي and أختي عن قيام how are you doing when sharing the food how are you doing with greeting everyone and spreading peace وأنت علي رضي الله عنه عن آل البيت الأطهار أجمعين he says إكرام الضيف والصوم بالصيف وقتل العدو بالسيف being hospitable to the guest fasting during summer and killing the enemy with the sword so how are you doing with the guest يا أخي and أختي when the guests come over do you say to your wife put the lobster away honey put the shrimp away they're gone now okay you can bring him in Subhanallah, man kana yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhar fal yukrim daifa. If you believe in Allah in the last day, be hospitable to your guest. And fasting during the summer, you're not asked to do things like this, but this Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu arda, he wants more reward. And he says, killing the enemy with the sword. And he goes to Abu Dhar al-Ghafari radiallahu anhu. He says, وَأَنْتَ يَا أَبَا Dhar." He says, أُحِبُّ الْمَرَدْ وَالْجُوعْ وَالْمَوْتِ Subhanallah. He says, illness, hunger, and death. So he asked him why. Everything was in line. He says, إِذَا مَرِدْ خَفَّ ذَنْبِي وَإِذَا جُعْتْ رَقَّ قَلْبِي وَإِذَا مِتْ لَقِيتُ رَبِّي He says, when I'm ill, my sins fall off. When I'm hungry, my heart becomes more spiritual, closer to Allah. And when I die, I meet my Maker, my Lord. Subhanallah. And then ask yourself the three questions again. What would it be, akhi and ukhti? Swiss bank account? A big house? A private yacht? Or a big automobile, right, akhi and ukhti? Not the best of the best, my brothers and sisters.